Hi, welcome to our second Goop Book Club event. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope you guys have been enjoying the book club so far. The group has been growing, so I guess that's a good sign. When we decided to create this group, we knew we wanted to choose books that inspire big conversations, especially ones that aren't always front and center. And so our current pick is exactly that. I'm very excited to be joined by our guest today, Shubangi Swaroop, the brilliant first time author of Latitudes of Longing. As I'm sure many of you experience, this is one of those books that haunts you, challenges you and changes you. It stirs up a lot of big questions like why did the universe begin and what is our purpose in it? Where do our stories begin and end? Some of you submitted your own questions and I'll be asking uh, Shubangi those as well. So thanks to you for submitting. Um, I'll also be announcing our next book club pick at the end. So stick around. All right. So without further ado, welcome Shubangi Swaroop. Fresh as, fresh as the um, morning dew in Mumbai. It's bedtime here. Apologies in advance if any of my kids make a cameo. It's way Same past her bedtime. <laughs> yes. Your daughter's like eight, nine months? Eight months? Nine, nine months. So she Ooh. is a crawling and licking monster right now. So she <laughs> may just make a cameo. No worries. We're kid friendly. I'm your first kid, right? Yes. Um, How is it going? That's hard. In the, in the midst of COVID. I, I think motherhood in the middle of a pandemic is a different league altogether. Yeah. And especially because, uh, when the child is teething, because she has also licked my hand sanitizer. She has licked my shoe. <laughs> it's like you snooze, you lose. So, I mean, my paranoia has now just those dived because I can't keep up with it. Yeah. I just can't. It's also one of those things where it's like the balance or feeling like they're so fragile and yet so sturdy. It's such a weird, strange um, experience, like simultaneous experience. Absolutely. And there's a lesson that she's actually taught me. You know, we have cabin fever and we're so fear, fearful of isolation. We haven't seen anyone. But I think her connections are deeper than ever with people. Even if she sees someone from a window, she's happy. Yeah. And there is a way a child can recognize a smile behind a face mask. And that's something that I didn't have. So yeah. I'm learning from her now. She's still having a happy time. She's not, you know, all cooped up and cagey and weird about it. She's still a happy kid. So maybe I can be a happy adult. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. What do you think is harder, like birthing a book or a baby? A book. <laughs> undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. And I was talking to a friend about it. It's because society takes responsibility for a child in a way that they do not take responsibility for a female author birthing a book. When we decide to write a book, especially in a relatively conservative society like mine, it is considered a whim or some kind of obsession, you know, like some uh, schizophrenia or something. So I did, I did not get the kind of support from society that I get when I have a child. Yeah. But is that that changed because it's been so widely acclaimed and so successful or is it still sort of perceived as like a woman or a woman's like side hustle almost? So the la in the last year, we saw a lot of female debut authors uh, killing it in the Indian publishing scene, sort of entering uh, without mm -hmm. entering into the top list uh, almost. But this pandemic has brought it, brought, I mean, brought the message back home that we still live in a patriarchal society. Mm. Because if someone, if people don't help you with the chores, then you don't get the time to write. If you don't, I mean, I feel like I'm back to the days of Virginia Woolf. If I don't have a room, if I don't get those two hours in the morning, then how can I write? So while there is a lot of support and accolade for the book that you have written, it comes too late. What about the process of writing and who, who stands by you then? For example, all the residencies are suddenly not available to me because we don't have a mother and child residency in the country. Mm. Yeah. And the fellowships that I relied upon. So 
that's something I'm going to work on. Are you, you were a journalist for a long time, right? Are you, yes. do, do you still, is that something that you also do or do you just try to focus on your own writing? So, um, I have uh, delved in virtual reality. I've produced documentaries in virtual reality. I have designed curriculums. After this book, after my book came out, I wrote a play and now I'm going to focus on my next novella. So even though I do work as a journalist, I do various kinds of writing mm -hmm. within fiction and nonfiction. How do you, how much of your book, I mean, it's so sprawling and epic, even though it's, it's so beautifully contained. Um, like it's not a, uh, it feels like it could be the length of four novels. Um, when you're researching it, like, where does it come from? Were you, who, where did, where did it, is it from your day? I know, I meant, I know on our site, you talked about, um, doing research as a pimp, which was a funny, which made me laugh. But how much of it came from your days? Since as I look like such a pimp, I can totally convince <laughs> people that I have one. <laughs> yeah. um, I was like, what does that mean, doing research as a pimp? Um, but, oh. but I ate two uh, apple pies and had two glasses of cold coffee to give myself the confidence. <laughs> which I think is a very unpimp like thing to do. I wasn't <laughs> drinking alcohol. I was just like, give me sugar. I need to be confident. <laughs> yeah. So when you, you're home, you're writing, like where, where does it come from? What's your source? Like what, what is it? So firstly, you were speaking about the four novellas, which can potentially be four independent novels. Uh, to me, a story is something that is complete by itself. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I have put these four novellas together is because they are incomplete in themselves and they complete each other. And uh, that is the philosophy that I'm working with is that sometimes our joys and our lessons and our learnings don't come from our own story. They can come from someone else's story. And that's the beauty of coexistence is everything is not about us. Mm -hmm. Like, if I can give you an example, you may have a really shitty day, but you come home and on your way home, you look at some puppies or your child gives you a smile. It's someone else's narrative that has come into yours and changed your, changed the end of your day, right? Mm -hmm. So we keep interacting. If we view stories as individuals, then we keep interacting and together we form a larger story. And that is what I wanted to work with. So there is a lot of heartbreak. There is a lot of incompletion in the various sections, but towards the end, they all complete in two characters. So, yeah, and this idea too that these stories are completed over multiple lives, right? That yes. that Chanda and yes. and they're that they've been together before, and they'll theoretically be together again. Um, yes, yes. Yeah. I'm so glad you caught on that. And uh, when I was uh, struggling to publish the book, someone told me that uh, I should stay away from rebirth as a concept because it won't work well for me in the West. Oh, really? That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I feel like your book, particularly at this time in COVID, and I'm curious about what the experience is like in India, but for, for many people here, sorry, um, whiny cats. The um, come up. The it. This has for many people been a deeply spiritual experience. Um, not only to sort of be t in a timeout or in this prolonged pause, but also just a moment of deep reflection about how we're living our lives, what we're consuming, how we're engaging. What's the purpose? Like, what are we trying to bring forward? What are these relationships that we've chosen? Um, and I think it'll be interesting if we ever move out of it. We're sort of in this prolonged wave and it's unclear when this will end. But um, I feel like a lot of people who previously might have called themselves, not even, I don't even know, but it's a certain sort of spirituality, but like who, who felt like there was no rhyme or, or, or highly scientific, we can even say, are sort of 
maybe at a point of feeling perplexed by these bigger questions of, yes, it's a pandemic and it's a virus, but it feels like so much more. It feels like a spiritual yes. slap yes. Um, from earth. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I loved that it's about scientists, yet they've sort of reached the end of their knowing. It's sort of this takeover, this submission, it felt like, to this idea that it can't all be explained or contained in, in this single level. So, I mean, I myself straddle that space. I am very curious and confused about science and spirituality and, and that space where, um, as you mentioned, where doubt and faith and all these other emotions come from. Mm -hmm. And that's a journey I make. And it's actually a relief to be a writer because fiction allows me to not judge ideas, but just explore it. Mm -hmm. it's, it gave me the freedom through this novel to live a thousand lives, to inhabit an element, to inhabit human characters, to inhabit animals, to inhabit anything that, you know, where the imagination could go. And I feel like I have lived a thousand lives through the process of writing, which is why I end with those lines with the possibility of you and I. I don't know who the you is and I don't entirely know the I in it yet. I'm still exploring myself, but I know that my journey began where this ended. I don't know how that happens, but fiction gives us that freedom. And I would, that, okay. There was a role that artists played once upon a time. We work with, we work in the realm of ideas. We work in the realm of making things possible. And somewhere, somehow, we started to just entertain people. And we went away from our manifesto, or that's the manifesto I think artists have at least. And uh, artists are on par with scientists and philosophers, you know. Uh, books and fiction plays a role in deciding what the future can look like and helping you inhabit various options of the present and the future and choosing where uh, we should go. And the pandemic seems like a very good time to reflect on that. Um, to me, it is not science and it's not even spirituality. It's just common sense that the, the lesson that the pandemic is uh, brought home that the survival of our species relies on the survival of the most vulnerable and the fragile amongst us. That is the strength mm -hmm. of our species. Uh, look at the movement uh, sparked by George Floyd's death. And I'm, I'm really grateful to see all the links that Booth is posting. Mm -hmm. Or uh, in India, upward migrants are facing a very ghastly situation, which we are not entirely aware of because of the lockdown currently. But I feel that we can only make it to the future if we take the fragile and vulnerable one, ones with us. And that just, just doesn't go for within our species, but also in terms of the planet. The planet is fragile to uh, other species, the critically endangered, the elements, the sea, the, the purity of the sea and the sky. So... I think this is an important lesson and it does, it, 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 all paths lead to this science, spirituality, common sense, everything leads to this lesson. I don't think we can ignore it anymore. And if someone hasn't used this pandemic to reflect, then chances are they may have a pandemic of, of their own after this. Yeah. <laughs> I just, this, this is going to be a pattern that will keep increasing till we learn our lessons. Yeah, no, it's true. And, and you talk about the fragility of, of the planet, but like she will endure, you know, we are the ones who are fragile as you sort of, it's whether it's a landslide or tsunami or yes. earthquakes or shifting mountains, blizzards, like yes. we are, we've created this idea that we're dominant, right? Over nature that we can, we can control yeah. the planet or, or, and that's a just kind of a joke in the reality of like her pure force and like what's 
what's absolutely possible. And then, yeah, as you mentioned, it's the most vulnerable, you know, the interconnection of us, how vulnerable we all are, and yet how um, the idea that we are somehow less, you know, that we're all dependent on each other's health and safety. Um, yeah. And you rightly say it's a joke, right, to think of the, it's, it's our hubris to think that we are on top of the pyramid. But how did this joke become a reality? Yeah. It's a very important question. Like what happened? You know, when did one line in a larger story become the only line of the story? I mean, uh, I apologize for those lengthy descriptions of nature and various elements in my novel. I'm totally guilty of that. And I'm guilty of a very slow pace. But how else do you tell a story of which you are not the center? It is... Yeah. It's a creative challenge, but I'm willing to take it and I'm glad readers stuck through it because we have to find a better way of looking at things. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting too, when, you were just, when we were talking about past lives and the role of fiction and the role of art, because without empathy, right, without the idea, without novels, without the ability to experience other people's stories or step so fully into their experience that you can imagine, you know, the Andaman Islands and um, that's the only way that we really have of expanding our awareness of outside of ourselves, right? And understanding how we are all connected. Um, it's really the, the best tool. And in the context of like George Floyd and everything that's happening here, um, it's sort of a cri finally feels like some a crisis of empathy of people being like, um, that could be me, that could be my child. Like, how is this happening? It's like we've we've sort of woken up from insanity um, in a strange way. Or and I think it's the busyness that was keeping us protected or keeping us from having to sort yeah. of engage. It's interesting because there's no other experience than reading a novel where you're so consumed and transported. I mean, maybe by watching a movie, but that's, a, I mean, it's always been my experience of books more than film. I feel that a book help, it, you know, takes um, the, ra the reader's imagination into uh, confidence. It, a book is incomplete until it meets the reader in their mind in a way yeah. that I feel mainstream films may not be doing right now. I don't know. I haven't seen those kinds of films yet, but a book <laughs> is more challenging. It is. Yeah, it requires, your, it requires a commitment of imagination and it's not, certainly not yes. painted for you um, and requires more work. Um, what, what's your, like, has this been something that's been sort of like rooting around in your mind? I know, um, that it's, was it your grandmother who grew up in the Andaman Islands? So the first story is loosely inspired by my grandparents, Chanda Devi and Girija Prasad. Well, the characters are inspired, but definitely not the outcome. My grandfather did not walk into a tsunami. <laughs> and my grandmother is 92 years old right now. Uh, so she is the inspiration behind Chanda Devi. I couldn't have imagined that character. I just happened to be her granddaughter. So she is 92 years old. She is alone in Delhi right now. Mm. And she's busy performing rituals for the welfare of the people. And she's a monk. She is a sannyasi. Yeah. Uh, yes, that is a monk by uh, the Indian Vedic system of life. She wears saffron and she's given up uh, worldly duties to look after the world so sorry yes she has given up uh, domestic duties to look after the world mm, she still inspires confidence in us if you want to know how Chanda Devi is right now well she tells us we're not going to die it's all going to be fine and we should just focus on looking after the world and the other people <laughs> so uh, she is a powerhouse when I gave birth to a daughter she said that Devi has blessed me with one of her forms and um, that I should respect it. And that's a beautiful thing to say. So that's, that's the kind of lady she is. What's her view of the pandemic? 
I don't know because I switched off at the point where she asked me that can you go on Twitter and ask the Prime Minister to meet me because I have something to tell him. <laughs> I mean that's the part I switched off on. <laughs> so I mean you know <laughs> she's very confident. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my god. Wait, and you do um you are an ardent you do you're a hardcore meditator still? Well, parenting has changed a few things. <laughs> and I think parenting is a test of meditation. The whole I mean the whole point of meditating is so that you can lead lead life in a balanced manner and difficult situations in a balanced manner and, and I feel the past year has been a test of that yeah I haven't been able to meditate but now I have to put my money where my mouth is basically <laughs> <laughs> yes you know in Vipassana they tell you to just observe your emotions watch them come and go be a be a passive observer and uh, that is what I'm doing right now yeah. Although I guess, yeah. I mean, in Vipassana, that's like 10 days of silence, right? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I, I did Vipassana. And sorry, back to the question of uh, were the characters, any of the other characters inspired by people I know? Besides the first two, not really. And uh, if I can add to it, most of the animals that show up are definitely inspired by real experiences, but not the human ones. Yeah. What about your experience? Do you talk to trees? <laughs> My grandmother does. I, I wish, so that is the dichotomy I carry. I, I definitely have trees as my friends. I definitely... Um, view them as my companions when I'm in my life. For example, we chose this house because of the beautiful neem tree by the window. But my, uh, my intellectual side prevents me from giving into this wholeheartedly. And I'm struggling with that. I think I'm closer to Girija Prasad in that way. Hi everyone, I'm I'm Kiki. I'm jumping in for Elise. Uh, Elise's connectivity just went out, and I was waiting in the wings. So here we go. Um, Shivangi, as you know, it's lovely to talk to you again, and hilarious that the connection went. <laughs> hilarious that the connection went out as you were talking about if you could talk to trees or not. Yeah, seems like a sign. Um, yes. I love everything you and Elise have been saying and we just wanted to make sure that we got to some of the questions that people from the Facebook group had written in so thank you everyone for sending those and Shivangi you've been such a champ and every time we see you posting in the Facebook group our whole team is like Shivangi's in there we're like so excited right. um, and we know everyone's really enjoyed being able to interact with you so thank you so much. Um, my pleasure so we had absolutely my pleasure. I'm so glad. So we had a few people who wrote in to the last video that you posted. Yeah. Um, Angelica asked a question, which we had talked about when we originally talked. Um, so she said, Buddhism seems to be woven throughout the book. Um, and she asked kind of what your relationship was to that religion. And if maybe you can speak a little bit to how you think of religion and spirituality in your own life, which I know you've touched on a little bit, but. Two of the regions that the novel is set in are Buddhist regions that is Burma and uh, Ladakh and they follow two different kinds of Buddhisms um, technically speaking but um, I myself uh, through the garb of the novel have been driven towards Buddhism or have, are, am bearing towards Buddhism it's not the religion I was born into I was born into a very devout Hindu household and I am currently not religious. I'm an atheist. Um, my child does not follow any religion. But there is something special about Buddhism. Gautam Buddha comes across as a scientist of the mind or something. He, he is uh, he's very modern. 
uh, his philosophy appeals to a curious and modern mind. And I was lucky to see the religion in practice in both these regions. For example, when I was speaking to, when I was interviewing the ex-political prisoners, some of them actually use their time in solitary confinement to meditate. Vipassana is a form of Buddhist meditation. I, of course, went to a sanctuary to do it, but here are people who practiced it when they most needed it. And I actually met uh, a man who had forgiven the police of the military official who had beaten him and tortured him. And he was at that point where he wanted to remove violent thoughts from his mind, like not just from his actions and his deeds, but from his mind. So he didn't want to think ill of anyone. And um, I was just like, wow, I'm, not, I'm so far away from that stage and I haven't met people who are working so intensely at their self-purification. So those were my interactions in Burma and in Ladakh. It's a different aspect of Buddhism that I um, learned from, which is living in the moment and living in living with respect to the ecosystem. Ladakh especially in the villages, is a great example of living in an ecologically sustainable way. Nothing goes to waste. There are some villages where there is no electricity, no running water, and uh, nor is there any plastic. Everything is reused. And that is also an aspect of spirituality. So um, I got to vicariously explore the religion through the novel. And I must say, it seems the most sensible of the current lot of religions we have. Yeah, and one thing I loved what you phrased over email the other day when we were talking, I think the second section is fault lines. Yes. Am I getting it right? Yeah. Yes. And you were just saying how each of us holds within us the ability to be the oppressor or to be the oppressed. And I think for me, that was kind of the religion and the spirituality woven throughout the book. And is that something that you saw when you were in Burma or like where did kind of that idea or that root take hold? It, it is a personal quest of mine. Let's put it that, that way. I actually have not studied literature and creative writing. I did my MSc in violence, conflict and development. And um, there was a point when after doing this master's in you know, conflict management and different kinds of structural violence. I actually experienced some of it myself from, for the lack of a better word, a victim's point of view. And I didn't want to buy into that narrative. I didn't want to be another statistic. So I started exploring these aspects within myself. You know, sometimes we can be the oppressor ourselves and sometimes we can be the oppressed. And it's important when you are oppressed or when you have experienced something difficult to use that experience to grow in your empathy and identify with other people. And uh, it's important to also see that within the oppressor. How shall I put it? Uh, it's important to not judge, but see that we have all these aspects within ourselves. Otherwise, you know, it can, it can lead to I don't know, it's not possible to appreciate life entirely if one doesn't do that. It's, it's, I found it personally liberating to not just inhabit one narrative, but to look at all these as aspects of human nature. And since I am, I also have human nature, I can sort of look at it from all those various points of view. And to give an example, uh, some people, in the West view this as a post-colonial narrative and in that narrative an Indian writer would be the colonized but actually I view myself as the colonizer right now I am the modern day colonizer India has taken over the Andaman Islands and has uh, obliterated the indigenous tribes for example and in my actions uh, in you know as a part of this kind of Amazon delivering 
small culture i am a colonizer of the planet so we are, i'm constantly inhabiting various uh roles yeah, and I if i can sorry add to it the third section valley is actually an exploration of um, seeing things from a possible uh a possibly sexually exploited point of view or exploiter point of view to see you know i identify with bebo as i have mentioned in the new video and i identify with women who have gone through experiences of sexual harassment and violence but i had to write it from thapa's point of view it was very difficult it was very difficult to not judge an old man who in have you know who visits dance bars and probably visits prostitutes too but having done that i came out of it uh much more healed because i could mm. humanize thapa in a way that i can't humanize in my personal life i should carry judgments and i judge people like that but fiction allowed me to not judge and just explore the character and humanize him and give him the kind of tenderness that i would like to give all human beings and that actually lead me in some way in a way it paints such a more truthful picture which i think is something you do so well throughout the book something else that connects to this that uh sarah from the group asked about was ways that you incorporated different oral traditions and tales and myths and that that woven throughout the book and i think feels especially strong for me towards the end of the book how, how did you and, and there's so many I love in the Facebook group how you kind of explain how you do these plays on different words and terms and they all have like different meanings. How did you kind of like map that out as you went? Like, did you start with, with so a single myth or an idea that you were going to explore? And my editor helped me understand that I was trying to write a creation myth based on science that helps. I didn't know I was doing that. but a creation myth is essentially you know something that comes from the oral traditions and folk tales to us and that's so true because without actively doing it uh, i spent all my years of writing reading only folk tales and works that were not written in english i stayed very far away from the literary canon there is no shakespeare or faulkner or whoever whoever in this you know in in my inspiration list for this book it's actually the regional publishing the oral stories that i heard first of all even the term oral stories is such a strange term because um, most of us hear stories from people you know i mean that's a story actually a storyteller the reason why we use the word storyteller is because we've been told stories there's no story writer so um, i have been major dominantly inspired by that stream and every place that i visited introduced me to people or storytellers who had their own genre it's almost like you know each one tells has their own cadence and tone to telling a story and i just tried my level best to to remain loyal to that tone and cadence so oral storytelling has had a huge influence in the novel the character of apo as uh, many people may not know is uh, he's the best oh yeah i totally love him he's inspired by an 8 year old shepherd boy that i met in ladakh so this little boy he's a tibetan nomad and he carries the certificate for looking after like 70 sheep all by himself and that's because he keeps rattling stories that's how he entertains himself so someone told me about him when i went to meet him and i asked him to tell me a story and uh, he just spoke for half an hour 40 minutes continuously the story didn't end so at some point i had to say stop because i was like that's a lot of transcribing but that guy was like a radio he could just go on and then the red rabbit ate the tail and then the queen came and da 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 so that's where the character of in apo comes from for me and uh, if i can add to this layer of 
story oral stories i think even even people from nature tell us stories if you're willing to listen to it like a rock or a tree or a fossil they also tell you stories and they also have their unique tone for example the layers in a rock can tell you about its past and its present and its future or a fossil of an ammonite can tell you so much you know about where it's been and how it lived its life so it's about being open to all those stories or listening to all those stories where did the sun and the moon story come from because i love that i think that story came from me <laughs> you're like it was it, me on the storytelling sorry i mean uh so to me the story of the sun and moon is actually uh, very modern uh it's an aspect of a relationship you know how i i feel like the moon when she says that she just doesn't want to be judged and to be loved is not enough you know by the center of the universe she wants to be accepted for who she is and she doesn't want to be judged and that's also mary you can't judge her you can love her but you can't judge her for her actions i feel that the desire that i carry strongly within a relationship and uh, i use that parable to explain that yes it's so as, good. as a woman as a woman i don't want to be judged by my demons i don't want to be judged by my uh, extreme actions i just want to be accepted and i thought the moon was a great metaphor for that and the sun a great metaphor for a powerful male and this idea that they complement one another or that they could understand and accept one another like you said yeah and still fight and kill each other in the process <laughs> and still come back <laughs> well right i mean we talked about this before so much of it is this like dis- destruction you know this primordial circle where like the destruction can in a sense like become the coming together again if we cycle through yes. yes and that's also the cycle of rocks or the cycle of nature it it's a constant transition and coming back rather than a beginning middle and an end it's a cycle which is where the inspiration for the primordial instinct came from which i i was fearful a lot of people may just consider like some kind of waffle or something so i made it a point to explain it in the video that it was a very good explanation Thanks. and i think too it's so often you know we're not comfortable with that feeling like we want there to be a big little middle and end but it's actually so satisfying when we kind of break free from that that rigid way of thinking i think that's the literary or the creative idea of enlightenment right for me as a writer if i can look beyond a middle beginning middle and end as a narrative structure then that is my form of enlightenment i've broken the the paradigm i've broken the paradigm of thinking and which is why actually in the novel i gave myself this brief that i will begin in the middle and i will end at the beginning and it sounds a bit strange but it's sort of cyclical so when i begin i don't begin at them getting married i begin at them having a scuffle on a night a few months into marriage so i'm beginning right in what do you call boom in the middle of their story it looks like the beginning but it's only the beginning because it's the first page it's not chronologically the beginning and when i end i actually end in the same way we started so there are all these concentric circles happening and also possibilities i think um, you know when we don't tell the whole story we allow the reader and we allow life itself to play out there are so many possibilities for example many people ask what happens between papa and bebo do they have a relationship do they uh, consummate their relationship where do they go from there well it's up to the reader to decide where they go from there and it's the same with the ending what happens to apo and gazala it's up to all of us and um, i dream of a kind of art 
or literature which opens up the possibility opens us up to possibilities and doesn't close them for us and an ending i feel like an ending is so dissatisfying because it just closes all the possibilities so i just wanted to open it up so in a way the story between the yeti and rana which is one of my favorite stories and something i could have wrote like heaps more on i just left it right in the beginning because that's my gift to the reader to complete that story in a way that they find satisfying well i'm personally so grateful that you wrote this book because i think it opens up so many possibilities of imagination and different ways of thinking and we were so honored to have you with us this month and i anyone who has not read this book i'm going to show the us cover all the covers are beautiful um but you read it it's stunning it's so gorgeous and shubang we can't wait to see what you do next um but thank you for being here i know it's early there and and we really appreciate it i know the time difference has been rough this whole time but um Thank you for having me. This has been an absolutely fun experience, and I'm going to miss it. So I will show up as a reader for your next book. You have to. And now I'm very excited to announce our July book club pick. I feel bad that I'm stealing Elisa's thunder, but I absolutely love this book. It's called Lot by Brian Washington. It originally came out in hardcover in 2019 in the states, and it's just out this year in paperback and. So many people put this on their best of the year list. A lot of critics, Barack Obama himself, and anyone who has not read this book now is the chance to pick it up in paperback. It is absolutely stunning. Brian Washington is a writer based in Houston, and this book really tells a, a story about a slice of Houston. So we start off with a young boy who is um, his parents are black and Latino. and he's really trying to make his way in the city and in a world that doesn't always see him for who he is he's falling in and out of love um and what's so incredible about this collection is that this boy's story this protagonist his story is interspersed with the story of the neighborhood the story of all of these different characters who make up his world and who are circling in and out of it it is really unforgettable unforgettable really affecting and i can't wait for you guys all to read it so pick up a copy of lot and if you haven't joined us in our facebook group or if you want to learn more about book club and what we're reading go to goop.com/goopbookclub that's goop.com/goopbookclub and yeah until next time thanks so much for joining and looking forward to hearing what you guys think bye